All right, thank you, Lou. Seems like everyone's warmed up now that you're out of the cold weather. Um, so I want to officially welcome you once again to the 2013 Economic Outlook Luncheon. And I'd like to introduce you to our panel and tell you a little bit about them, each of them, although several do not need any introduction as well. Uh, first up, and if you'll join me on stage when I call your name, Angelo Chardella. Not Cinderella, as he's accidentally been introduced before. Uh, he's the Austin Complex Director for Merrill Lynch. He began his career at Merrill Lynch in 2000 um, and finished their program there for financial advisors. He later accepted an offer to join Morgan Stanley in Raleigh, North Carolina, before returning to his Merrill home as Raleigh's complex sales manager. Angelo went on to secure the associate director role in Atlanta and worked with Merrill's ultra high net worth clients and advisors to, prefer, to provide holistic solutions to their financial concerns. He's now serving here in Austin with us as the complex director for Merrill Lynch's Capital Complex. Um, he's responsible for financial advisors, client support staff, and financial solutions to his affluent clients. He attended the University of South Carolina on a soccer scholarship and after earning his political science degree, went on to play professional soccer in Wales, Great Britain. So maybe you have some friends there and you can take that nonstop flight. Sure. Um, and it also worked in his family business. So I don't know what kind of accent you have now with Atlanta, Raleigh, South Carolina, Wales, Wales and Texas, but we're excited to hear it. So welcome, uh, uh, Angelo Chardella. Thank you. Next up is Gary Farmer, president of Heritage Title Company of Austin and Heritage Exchange Corporation of Texas. He's been involved in the title insurance business since 1985 and obviously, um, as you heard from Lou, is involved in a variety of charitable and civic endeavors in Central Texas. He serves as chairman of the Opportunity Austin 3.0 campaign, a board member of the University of Texas Chancellor's, Chancellor's Council, the UT Development Board, the Director's Council for UT Department of Theater and Dance, um, the Austin Chamber of Commerce, President's Council of RECA, the Greater Austin Crime Commission, the Trust for Public Land, the, uh, I can go on and on, cut. <laughs> um, he's also served on, I think this is really important, three mayoral task forces dealing with the economy, the environment, and healthcare. Um, He's a past Austinite of the year and is a graduate of the University of Texas along with his wife and uh, three daughters, two UT grads and one uh, still there. Also, rumor has it that Gary is about to be a father of the bride this weekend. So please welcome Gary Farmer. Ryan Robinson is the city of Austin's demographer. He's a native Austinite, graduating from Austin High and the University of Texas. And after working at the state's general land office under Commissioner Morrow for just over a year, he attended the University of Georgia in a Athens, where he obtained his master's degree in geography. He began his demographic career as an enrollment for forecaster and boundary planner for a large, growing suburban school system Atlanta, in Atlanta and started working for the city of Austin in 1990 and directs their demographics work program since 1995. His professional interests, which include data mapping and interpretation, population change, and the rise and fall of American cities. And he's fascinated by what makes cities tick and deeply believes Austin is one of the greatest in the country. And if you've ever had a chance to have coffee or have a meeting with Ryan, you'll, you'll totally agree with his passion. And finally, Rick Whiteley. And finally, Rick Whiteley, partner, Oxford Commercial. He's a graduate of University of Texas at Austin. I'm sensing a trend here. Um, he specializes in representing tenants and buyers for over 30 years. He's provided clients in Austin with the highest level of real estate service. And his experience is in all facets of the office building business. Um, and many accomplishments throughout his career include being named the Austin Chamber of Commerce's Volunteer of the Year and being listed as one of the top heavy hitters in the Austin Business Journal and receiving the ABJ's Best Real Estate Award. So I like that. Uh, he's also a multiple re year recipient of the Oxford Commercial Top Producer Award. He served on many boards, including the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce, uh, served as an officer of Opportunity Austin's Business Retention 
Program and the Rotary Club of Austin. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. So I'm kind of sitting behind you, standing behind you guys here, but um, we're here to have a conversation on Austin's future. That's why we're all here today. So I'd like to start out with a general kind of overarching question, and I'd like you to start here, Gary, on how are Austin's 2014 economic prospects shaping up? Well, Heather, let me say very quickly that um, our prospects for 2014 are great. Uh, we have never been, in my opinion, we have never been better positioned than we are today. The reason for that is because over the course of the last 10 years, uh, we have done the work necessary to create a more diversified economy and therefore a more sustainable economy. And there's nothing like having momentum on your side. Uh, many of you may know, and if you don't, you should know, that Austin, Texas is the most prolific creator of jobs in the United States of America. On a percentage basis, no other major metropolitan area comes close. We've created almost 200,000 jobs and $9.9 .9 billion of new wage in the last nine years and 10 months. I think the, uh, I think the data stops at uh, end of October. And so when you have that kind of momentum, it's going to carry you through. But let me be sure to say that the quickest way to lose that great outlook and that great uh, uh, forward thinking uh, attitude is to become complacent. We cannot do that. We simply cannot do that. The reason we're having so much success is because of our qualified labor force. We have a workforce that's second to none. We're young and we're smart. And I use that collective. I'm neither young nor smart. But as a community, <laughs> we are young and we are smart. And that's why companies are coming here. You, you mentioned the labor market. Um, so, from all of your vantage points, how do you think the labor market looks within your industries? Do you, you want me to? I'll, oh, I'll, you can continue. I'll, can, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, expand continue. on that a little bit. Uh, again, we're young. About 69% of our population is 45 years or younger. Uh, a little over 40% of our adult population, older than 25, has at least a bachelor's degree. We're blessed to have great colleges and universities in our region. And we have about 180,000 college students uh, within a 60-mile radius of where we're sitting today. And then if you expand that a little bit, it, it blows up to about 300,000 college students. These are young, smart, industrious folks uh, that want a job and want to work here, so it's the workforce. And in addition to that, we have uh, an unbelievable easy time in recruiting. I see young people all the time and they come from, I mean, University of Florida, University of North Carolina, Ole Miss, I mean, all around the country, these young kids are coming here to look for an opportunity. So our labor force is good, uh, but we've got to continue to work on it, not without its challenges. Our demographic profile is changing uh, rapidly and we've got to pay very close attention to that to make sure we keep these kids in school and get them through the system. So Heather, I'll touch on that too. So I've been in Austin for all of uh, 12 months and 10 days. And so I'm one of the people that's clogging up the highways everyone complains about, so sorry about that. Uh, and my wife and kids are here too. So, but my role with Merrill Lynch, I have about 150 employees scattered around the greater Austin area. I could have 300 because the number of resumes I see on a daily basis, on, almost on an hourly basis, people that want to move to Austin from all parts of the country that want to come to work for Merrill Lynch in the financial services industry because they look at the demographics that Gary was alluding to for the greater Austin community. So in my opinion, Austin is primed for extensive growth going forward also. It's why I was brought here. It's why my boss that lives up in Dallas brought me into Austin because it is a growth market and it will continue to grow. And, and looking at the real estate market, I mean, we're right at the kind of starting edge of the big boom in terms of the office building 
Uh, there's currently about a million, 800,000 square feet under construction, about half of that downtown. So we're beginning to see that. I mean, some of it out in the suburbs. We'll continue to see that here over, certainly over the next two years. So you see the development starting. And like Angelo, I mean, we, we have a lot of young brokers already in our office. There are a ton of people who are looking to relocate here to Austin and kind of participate in the next wave, uh, which is, is going to be very fruitful for many people. I mean, you look outside of the office building side, I mean, the uh, multifamily market has just gone crazy. You see high-rise apartments, the, the, the more traditional ones going up all around town. So this is certainly a very good time in the uh, real estate market. Gary, could you also speak to us about specific prospects, the pipeline as, you, as we talk into 2014? Specific prospects? Well, Mike Rollins would shoot me if I thought that. <laughs> so prospects in general, um, what sure. you can talk about. What's sure. kind of in the pipeline as we go look forward um, into 2014? Well, I, I said earlier, I've never seen us in a better position than we are currently. Uh, the chamber uh, catalogs prospects into three general groups, just a, a kind of a garden variety prospect. That means somebody has probably ask for some information. There's been some exchange uh, between the chamber staff, which by the way is excellent at what they do. Uh, or then uh, an active prospect likely means that they have been here, boots on the ground in Central Texas. And I should say that Opportunity Austin is not Austin-centric. It's Travis Williamson Hayes Bastrop in Caldwell County. That's our Central Texas region. An active prospect has been here, they're engaged, they're really looking at Central Texas as a viable place to relocate or expand. And then hot prospects. And hot prospects is a, is, is a category of prospects that are in active consideration. It could be Austin versus one of our natural competitors. It could be Austin as one of several communities under consideration. At the end of October, my recollection is, Heather, that we had 39 active prospects. I don't ever remember in the past nine years and 10 months ever having 39 active prospects. Usually high 20s, maybe low 30s, but a 39. So the prospects are here and they're engaged, they're trying to make decisions. And the good news is those are coming from the digital media arena, the clean energy sector, uh, the biomed medical device sector, uh, software is still big for us, data centers, um, headquarters. I think this is the most exciting category of prospects that we have, irrespective of what they do. They're thinking about locating their regional or corporate headquarters in Central Texas. I say that's important because if you have the headquarters, you have their hearts, minds, and pocketbooks. And they will make decisions to invest in our community, in the nonprofit sector, uh, the arts, uh, all of the things that you want to do to fill out the tapestry that we call home. So the headquarters sector is a very active sector as well. So Angelo, um, I have kind of a two-parter question for you. So how does the economic macro outlook, view of the economy look, and compare that to the micro view of Austin? Um, and then how do you expect monetary policy to kind of impact the local economy looking forward to next year? So that was three questions, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's talk about so uh, as Heather said, I was a political science major. I played soccer, played soccer overseas. I didn't major in econ. I didn't major in business. I don't have an MBA. Uh, all the economic training I've received has been uh, on-the-job experience. Uh, I've been with Merrill Lynch for quite some time. Uh, grew up in a small business household, so I saw economy and what uh, economics and what that meant um, from a very up close and personal uh, vantage point. So, from a macro view, and uh, you know, it's probably not the right terminology, but the U.S. economy has been in rehab for the last few years. Okay, and not the bad rehab, but the good rehabilitation. Uh, if you've ever had to do any type of physical therapy, that's where the U.S. economy has been. So we are coming out of rehab now, getting ready to go back onto the field. That's where the U.S. economy is. Now, there's still a, a danger there that we could step off the curb and sprain our ankle yet again. 
but the housing market is improving. The jobs market report that just came out this morning looks much, much better. The U.S. economy, both from the private sector uh, and the public sector, have really improved their balance sheet. With the fact that interest rates have been basically zero, the, you know, everyone in this audience, you have cleaned up your personal balance sheet. You haven't used low interest rates to go out there and borrow more and more money. You haven't. You've actually started saving more. You've eradicated a lot of your debt. So the U.S. consumer is in much, much better shape than, say, four or five years ago. Housing market's improving. Now, lending is coming back more so than what you might be reading. Uh, interest rates have been kept very, very low. And so speaking of interest rates, I, I smile when I think about that. Uh, I was speaking with one of my senior financial advisors this morning, said when he first bought a house, his interest rate was 14%. And he said this was back in the 80s. He actually, actually paid uh, some points to buy it down to 14%. So, you know, with that, I'm smiling because where we live, uh, and I grew up on the coast of North Carolina, and so those of you who have ever lived on the coast, people are always going to move to the coast. So no matter what the Fed does with interest rates and, and mortgage rates, people are still going to come here. People are still going to come here, still going to buy a home. They're still going to come here because of the environment, the schools, the entire uh, environment we have here in Austin. So from a monetary policy standpoint, the way I look at it, I'm never ever going to try to predict what the Fed's going to do. That, that's a losing battle. You just, you're never going to win that. But it, if you look at it, there is no impetus for the Fed to raise rates. I go back to the rehabilitation analogy. We aren't fully recovered yet. There's still danger. The federal government could do what they're going to do. They could, we could have another shutdown. Europe, um, I still have family in Italy, so Europe is still in a state of disarray. They're still going through auster austerity measures there. So all that could impact what the Fed's going to do. So in my opinion, just because rates are basically zero doesn't mean they have to go up in 2014. That, that's not an economic rule. It's what people think. It, rates might not go up again until 2016. If I had a crystal ball, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be sitting over in Italy, retired. So I can't tell you what's going to happen with rates. But as I look forward, I don't see the economy strong enough yet for the Fed to uh, bring back any type of shock to the economic system. Did I answer all three questions? Okay. Can you narrow it down into Austin a bit? So, so, all right. So from the Austin market, so I actually came here sight unseen. Never been to Texas, never been to Austin in my life. I was East Coast, kind of a Southern person. So I did my research on Austin also. The Austin market has the highest projected growth rate for million dollar households uh, than any other market in the U.S. In fact, it's double the U.S. average. Million dollar households in the greater Austin area are uh, predicted to increase by 20%, which is double the national average. So if you look at it from that standpoint, the reason that Merrill Lynch is here and growing our presence is because the demographics of Austin speak to continual growth. Traffic will not delay the growth. Now, traffic, we need to have a plan for traffic, all right, and the little, what was your comment, Gary, about the little segments that we build? That's not going to solve it. Uh, I live up in Steiner Ranch. I work downtown. I have a bit of a drive, but I just moved here from Atlanta. So, I mean, to me, it's, it's like the sun coming up in the morning. The traffic is the traffic. So that's not going to derail our growth. Now, what we need to, to think about is that if it forces people out of downtown into the suburbs, I would not like to see Austin become Atlanta to where downtown Atlanta, where I spent the last three and a half years, no one walks. I, I, I walked here this morning. It was a little chilly, uh, but I still walked here. If we push all the businesses out of downtown into the suburbs, the viable downtown that we have here in Austin goes away. So that's a concern, and that's a traffic concern. But I, I think there's plans in place to address that. From, from the housing market standpoint, affordable housing for the people moving here that are coming here for the American dream, for the opportunity that exists in Austin, the housing market, even though it is increasing, people will still come here and buy homes. Interest rates are not going to impact that. The, the housing market will continue to outpace the U.S. 
because people are moving here. So my, my outlook for Austin is sky high, as is the gentleman that runs all of Merrill Lynch. Every time I talk to him, his outlook for Austin is sky high too, which is why I have more gray hair than I had 12 months ago. <laughs> uh, so Austin, as we all see, seems to be on the national headlines on every list these days, on top 10 lists, everywhere we look. Yesterday, the Millikan Institute uh, released that Austin reclaimed its number one spot on the best performing cities index, largely due to the technology sector. Are there any other industries, Gary, you mentioned a couple, um, that are really on the rise in Austin? And besides technology, what other industries do you see coming to the forefront over the next year? Ryan, you want to take that? I think we're going to start to see pretty serious expansions in our healthcare um, sector. Um, as the med school goes forward, that's probably more than you know a couple of years away. Um, I think biomed is, is 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 very promising, and I think that we you know high tech is such an all encompassing term that we're doing so many different things that we could throw into that bucket. Um, I think we've established ourselves as a wireless capital, as a wireless cluster uh, in, in the country. Certainly, gaming, video, the creative stuff uh, that we've done, all of that's extremely promising. I mean, one, one quick follow-up about this notion that I agree that how much momentum there is. Demographically, I think when you look out at the national landscape of cities, it's become a collection of winners and losers, and that's somewhat different than what we've seen in the past. 30, 40 years ago, it wasn't this, you know, discrete grouping. And even though the national economy is getting better, because Austin was sort of last in, first out, we've had a relative advantage economically over almost every other market in the country. Um, I think it will be interesting to see as the national economy improves, can we maintain that advantage and can, can we make, continue to be a, a destination city? And so with that, it just um, so during the video, someone mentioned Raleigh, North Carolina. So. I'm from North Carolina, so I've lived in Raleigh before. And there's Research Triangle Park, which is constantly competing with us and, and, and other cities too for the technology industry, uh, biopharma, pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, the, the woman in the video mentioned that we have to keep forging ahead. Otherwise, my good friends in Raleigh will continue to try to take business away from us. So our opportunities still exist. The growth potential is, is still there. but People, we're on everyone's radar. Cities do compete for business. We're at the top of everyone's list to try to take business away from now. We're not just Austin trying to take business away from, say, Silicon Valley or other parts of the country. We're now on other cities' radar as far as taking business away from us. So I hear growth, growth, growth. So are we doing everything we need to as a community to keep up with this growth? No, no, no. <laughs> no, we're not. Um, we've said for a very long time that uh, traffic in Central Texas could be our Achilles heel. And I think that um, if we're not very mindful of our infrastructure needs, traffic being chief among them, uh, that we will see uh, a diminished quality of life in this community. Uh, so it's very serious, and I think everyone in this room has a responsibility to let our elected officials know that we want investment in infrastructure. Again, primarily transportation infrastructure, water being close behind. Uh, I think it is ridiculous that 20-something years after the first bonds for 45 Southwest were let, that we're still having an intramural competition among elected officials as to whether 45 Southwest should be built or not. Now you can disagree with that if you want to based on environmental concerns, but I think we need to start looking at the totality of the environment. Uh, it's not just about water quality, it's about air quality, it's about the human condition quality. You know, in, in Central Texas, you're about 40% more likely to be involved in a traffic fatality than our comparably sized cities. That just means we have too many cars on too few lanes. And so we've got to start building road systems. We've got to expedite that. And we've got to be uh, broader thinking to look at multimodal transportation uh, every day in every way. Each and every project must make sense. The resource is too precious. We don't have the money that we need 
And so we've got to measure every project, whether it's road, bus, rail, whatever the case may be, to make sure that that project is going to be accretive to our regional transportation system. It's got to mitigate congestion. If not, it's not going to be so much fun trying to go to your kid's soccer game or ballet contest, cheer competition in my case with three daughters. Um, it's not going to be as easy to move goods and employees around this community. And so we've got to start looking more at the totality of our environment uh, and be mindful about that. We're a big city now. I think the 11th largest in the country. We're a big MSA. I think about the 40th largest in the country. And so we've got to address some of these problems in forward-looking ways as opposed to being tied to past positions that are really intractable. I'm going to pick up, I mean, I completely agree with Gary and traffic congestion and everything. If you look over the past few years, I think we've done a good job as a community in terms of recognizing some of the needs and taking actions to begin to address those. I mean, the bond election in 2012 provided for a lot of different things that we're going to need. Uh, our, our efforts this year to uh, get the affordable housing, the one that didn't pass the year before. Um, I mean, that, I think that's a very positive indication of the recognition in the community of, of us taking care of our own business uh, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I think the continued expansion at, uh, at the airport, I think it's a good textbook example of something that's keeping up with the growth as we go along and, and staying a bit ahead of that. Um, so those types of things to me and others certainly are just a good indication that while there's a lot of things to be done, hopefully we're getting to work on some of those things that have needed attention for a good while. So Ryan, this one's for you. Um, what are the changing demographics? What do they mean for our city? Well, a couple of quick things, and, and we, we've uh, mentioned it, is that we're such a more diverse community, such a more heterogeneous community than we were 30 years ago, not just racially and ethnically, but culturally, economically. Um, and that cultural diversity, I think, has become one of our biggest economic development engines. Now, at the same time, that diversity gives us a responsibility. There's a local economist in town by the name of John Roberts. He has a quote on this. I use it all the time. A city's level of sustainability is in direct proportion to its ability to integrate its diversity. So certainly diversity is a positive, but only if you integrate it, only if it's truly in, in, inclusive. Cities that didn't diversify in the double aughts didn't grow. They're dying on the vine. They would do anything to have our kind of diversity that, that we've got, just organically. But if we don't, if, we, if we're not mindful, to use your term, we will indeed become this tale of two cities, this, you know, this, this deeply divided city. And a deep division like that, I think, could derail us uh, going forward, in addition to our traffic and, 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 and water concerns. So I guess my, my, my point is that it, it, it's a huge positive, but we've got to take advantage of it. And I think that Opportunity Austin says it best with, give them a job, and then everything else begins to fall in place. So they say if you build it, they will come, but where will we build it? Where are we going to build these jobs? Where are, we going, when are, the, where are the businesses going to go that are coming to Austin in the next year to five years? I touched on it a minute ago in terms of kind of the current level of office construction anyway. I mean, we're seeing more and more development in downtown. I mean, we've got uh, two new buildings, uh, two renovations. I mean, the Colorado Tower, uh, IBC Bank Plaza being the two new ones, uh, five... Uh, 15, I'm sorry, 511 Congress, and then the Sea Home developments being the, the renovations and actually an expansion at Sea Home as well. Um, you see a lot more employers and uh, people interested in coming downtown and the energy of downtown in terms of the live, work, play aspect of that. So I think you'll continue to see uh, more and more folks taking a hard look at downtown and, and relocating there and, and as new companies come in. I mean, the Facebook, for, for example, is, of a recent one that's come in and started at 30,000 feet, now up to about 90,000 square feet there at 300 West 6. Uh, I think you'll see the traditional growth patterns in the other sub-markets. Uh, I mean, the other area that's got probably 300,000 square feet of new construction going right now is North Central Austin with the domain. So that area, once again, kind of the live, work, play aspect of that seems to be very appealing. Um, Northwest has always been strong, far Northwest. Uh, new project there at 360 and 2222 in Champion Office Park. Uh, and then a lot in the Southwest market, more small stuff, but a lot of stuff that's ready to start up. 
Um, on the industrial side, I think you'll continue to see it in those areas where you've got inexpensive land costs. So the southeast Austin, northeast Austin, north central, uh, there's a pretty good size, about 450,000 square foot project now, uh, just right off I-35, um, up, up just in Pflugerville, just adjacent to Pflugerville. So uh, I think we'll continue to see those kind of trends as the building continues. So. You know, Heather, our, our, um, our long-term mentality in Austin has been that we abhorred sprawl, but we despise density. And you simply can't have it both ways. And I think one of the most exciting things that has happened over the course of, say, the last 10 years is, uh, is the density that has come to the central core. And I think the mayor has done a fantastic job of helping shepherd uh, policy to accommodate that. We've got to continue to do that because we'll better utilize our infrastructure. It's cheaper if we can locate them close in, uh, go up, you create more tax base uh, that can help float the rest of the boat. So we're going to have to continue working on our downtown, which I think is uh, one of the more exciting downtowns in America right now. It's just so much fun. And I mean, I've always office downtown, and it's just amazing to see the energy and the vibrancy that we have downtown. But as Rick said, we also need to look at developments like the Domain. I see Bryce Miller sitting here. Uh, the Domain is a phenomenal example of what can happen given proper policy. And uh, it's just second to none. And we can look around this community, the entirety of the region, where we can create these live, work, play opportunities. We're going to have to do that uh, going forward. Now, the traditional development pattern, as you know, is uh, uphill, upwind, and upriver. And that's northwest. Now, it's not uh, coincidental, I think, that we've put so much infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Our one rail line is uh, northwest down to central Austin, uh, uh, 183A. Uh, north Mopac, 45, north, all of, we're putting a lot of infrastructure up there, and if you look at uh, our economic development successes over the last couple of years, Apple, Visa, HID Global, et cetera, all in that Palmer corridor, uh, the businesses will follow the infrastructure as well. A quick follow-up. I think that you guys talk about the domain. I think uh, Mueller is also a good example. And, and the city's recently adopted comprehensive plan, Imagine Austin, calls for lots of these activity centers. And then I'll step out and say, I'd like to see them stitched together with rail. Um, I think we do need roadway construction, but every single national expert we've brought to town in the last year has told us the same thing. Build trains. And again, that may be going out on some thin ice. Not that we don't need road construction, but we're not going to be able to build our way out of this entirely without a multimodal approach. And so I think if we have a, a, a network of, of inner city activity centers that you, can, that you can get to by train, that to me is the, is, is the future. Okay, so we're kind of wrapping up our time here. Um, I'm going to pose you all each uh, one final question. And that is, give me your two visions for Austin in the next five years. A best case? and a worst case? I'll go best case. Uh, I mean, I think what we've, what we've seen <laughs> over the past, past nine years or so, I mean, even through the recession, I mean, the, the continued kind of progressive growth that we've had, I think that that same type of thing for aver able to average that roughly 3%, I think is what we've seen over the last three years. If we're able to continue to sustain that type of job growth uh, manage the new people coming into town in terms of the population growth uh, and not become complacent. I think that that probably represents the best picture uh, to, to, for the community on an ongoing basis. Uh, but my worst case scenario, I guess, is, is that national recession that really does have a big impact on Austin. I mean, we were fortunate the last time around, I mean, while we all felt the pain to a certain extent, uh, we didn't take nearly the blow that some of the other states and cities did, the Floridas, the Nevadas, all of that. So uh, that, that looms out there, it seems like, more often than maybe it should. And I mean, we're coming out, like uh, Angelo said, but uh, the, the prospect of potentially sinking back for any number of reasons seems to be there. So, uh, Best case, Heather, is that Austin continues to build upon its primary assets and we continue to diversify uh, and strengthen our economy. Uh, we, we've been very fortunate to have strong public leadership 
uh, Mayor Leffingwell, Commissioner Todd. We've, we've had very good uh, elected officials and we've been able to create very good public-private partnerships. Uh, we must continue that. I, I will tell you that if I start to look at worst case scenarios, uh, I'm very disappointed in the city council's recent vote to change our economic development policy. And I'm disappointed because the changes are gonna make it harder for Austin to compete. And it's gonna make us particularly disadvantaged when it comes to creating opportunity for people without the benefit of education. People that do not have a high school diploma or a college degree, my opinion, have been set back significantly uh, by this new policy. Basically, uh, council included some new provisions which is gonna make it more expensive for business to operate here. Business seeks the bottom line. And we can be as chaotic as we wanna be uh, and joust at all the right windmills, but if our competitor cities aren't doing the same, then we're an outlier. And then we're not as likely to be competitive. And, and so I worry about those uh, without the benefit of education. Disproportionately, that affects people of color. And so to do to adopt a policy which hurts those people is exactly the wrong thing to do, in my opinion. Uh, we've got to create opportunity for everybody in this community. That's how we'll have a rising tide. That's how we'll start to mitigate this growing disparity between the haves and the have-nots. So I, I, I uh, and I've told almost all of the council members that I was going to talk in this manner because I think we as a community need to have a very candid conversation about it. We've been blessed with good public leadership. I'm fearful that politics are creeping into policy, and I don't think that's very advisable for us. Uh, and I think there is a sense of complacency, a sense that Austin is gonna do so well, we don't have to compete. And that's not the history of the world. Uh, we are in a global competition every day in every way. And if we wanna succeed, we better have good policy, we better have good execution. Uh, we need the whole of the community involved and not disproportionately small but vocal groups, my opinion. I'm not going to try and follow that, no way. Exactly. <laughs> I was going to take off my mic. Can I, take off my mic anyway. I knew which way to go, Farmer, didn't I? Yes, you did. <laughs> So, I will have to speak. I can't. People that yes. know me know I have to speak. Uh, so, <laughs> best case, Austin continues to be a city of opportunity. Uh, the achievement of the American dream strikes home with me personally. My dad immigrated to this country back in the uh, 50s to achieve the American dream. So, it, you talk about diversity, you talk about uh, cultural diversity. It's very important to me. I think it's important to this city's success growing for going forward. We have to maintain that, that diversity. That, that's it's key to our success. Uh, otherwise, we will wither away and die like some other cities have too. Uh, so that's the best case, that we, can, we continue to be city of opportunity, city of change. We have the wherewithal in this city to be the model city of how to grow and how to adapt to that growth. I mean, the whole thing about you know, keeping Austin weird, well, we don't have to follow the model of A, B, and C of how to fix the, the traffic congestion. We, we can look at different ways to, to adapt to that. So to me, that's our opportunity, model city. Now, worst case is that the, the tourism business in Austin is, is fantastic. It's great. Every person I've ever met in my entire life wants to come visit me and my family now. Not because they like me so much, it's, it's where we live. So which is great, and it's great for the economy, it's great for Austin, but that, that's a two-edged sword too. We have to be careful we don't sell our soul to tourism and drives business, once again, away from downtown and out into the suburbs or out into the country because there's so much tourism in the city, it drives people away. So that, that to me, that would be the worst case that would happen, but I think continuity and, and public leadership will prevent that from happening. Well, I think we could probably ask 100 more questions to this panel of experts, um, but we're going to wrap it up. And I thank you very much for uh, joining the panel today and giving us a 2014 economic outlook. <laughs>